Welcome to Module 3, Video 2 for IN158 3D Animation 1 at Butler Community College. I am your instructor, John Simpson. In this lesson, we will begin exploring editable poly subobjects and the many, many tools that are available for us to use in modeling. Begin by creating a box using either the keyboard entry or the click and drag method. In the Modify tab, set the length, width, and height to 1, 1, and 12. Set the number of length and width segments to 1 and the height segments to 12. In the modifier list, choose the bend modifier. Set the angle input to 180. We now have an arch, but it's kind of plain and boring. Basic shapes and modifiers will only get the model so far. To take our model to the next level, we need to access the object's subobjects. We access these subobjects through what is called an editable poly. There are many ways to access editable poly tools. Here are two different ways. There is an editable poly modifier that can be applied to the object and will be affected by the modifiers that come before it or lower in the stack and have an effect on the modifiers that come after it, those higher in the stack. All options will remain available, but changing settings in one modifier may adversely affect modifiers higher in the stack. Max will usually tell you when this is going to happen. Read any pop-ups that appear. They are important. This method is classified as non-destructive and can be removed, resulting in the object reverting to its previous state if you decide later it was a mistake. The second way I'm going to demonstrate is classified as a destructive method. It converts the object from the primitive object type to the editable poly object type. The properties for the primitive are lost. When we convert to editable poly, all modifiers are applied to the object and then removed, thus making them permanent. When this occurs, the options for those modifiers are no longer available. Unlike using the modifier, this is not easily undone if we change our minds later. With the box selected, right-click in the viewport and choose Convert to Editable Poly. Editable polys consist of the following sub-objects. Vertexes. These are a point in space. They have a position on the X, Y, and Z axes. An edge. An edge is a straight line that connects two vertices. Edges are always straight. For a model to be able to bend, it will need many edges. The polygon comes next. A polygon is three or more closed edges. Four edges is preferred. Finally, an element. All connected polygons form an element within an editable poly. The Shift, Alt, and Control keys on the keyboard act as modifiers to how your tool behaves. For instance, if you have an object selected and wish to add to your selection, you press the Control click key and left-click the objects you wish to add. Conversely, if you wish to remove objects from a selection, press the Alt key and left-click the object you want to remove from the selection. Using the Shift key while moving, rotating, or scaling an object will bring up options for making a copy of the object. These dialog boxes will vary depending on what is being copied. In this case, I have copied an element within an editable poly object. So now there are two elements within the single editable poly object. To switch quickly among the sub-object selection modes, use the 1 through 5 keys on your keyboard. Now that we know the names of the sub-objects and some of the roles they perform, let's take a look at a few of the editable poly sub-object tools. The command panel contains a variety of tools to manipulate the sub-objects. These tools change depending on what object is selected. There are far too many to explain them all. Experimentation and exploration is recommended. We will focus primarily on some polygon tools and an edge tool that lets you add segments only where needed. Click on the caddy next to the name to access the tool's properties. A few of the main tools are, in the polygon selection mode, the inset tool. The inset tool creates new geometry inside a polygon allowing for the creation of borders. The Extrude tool creates geometry by pulling out or pushing in faces. The Bridge tool connects two facing polygons with new geometry. 
now switch to edge selection mode. Using the connect tool connects all selected edges with new edges. Learning and understanding these tools is crucial to using Max effectively. We learned how to create text in Module 2, but there is much more to spline modeling. Now we will learn how to trace an outline and then use modifiers to make it 3D. Additionally, we created a material that contained properties like the diffuse or the main color and the specularity, the highlights. For this lesson, we will be adding an image to the material and attaching that material to a plane so we can trace the outline of an arch accurately. Create a plane of the appropriate dimensions or aspect ratio of the image. In my case, I'm going with 38.4 units by 55 units. I've inverted the order so the plane dimensions would be on the correct XY axis. If you don't do this, your image will be oriented the wrong way. Create a standard material in the Slate Material Editor by dragging one out from the browser window into the work area. Click and drag from the diffuse slot on the left side of the material into an empty area of the work panel and release the mouse. Select bitmap from the pop-up window. Now this is important. When you begin a project you set the project folder. If you have questions about this see module 2. Setting the project folder tells Max to look for external assets in certain folders by default. One such folder is the Scene Assets Images folder. When we use an image or sound file or any variety of external files, Max links to the file location. So if you move the Max file, but not your texture files, then that data will be lost when you open the Max file from its new location. Since I have set up the project folder correctly, Max knows to look in the Scene Assets Images folder inside the project folder for the images I want to use as textures. It makes sense for me to save all of my images, sounds, etc. in the appropriate folders. That way, if I transport my file, I can compress the project folder knowing that my supporting files are in the correct folders. Once the file is uncompressed in the new location, it may be necessary to relink the images when opening the Max file for the first time. This is a simple matter of reading and following the prompts that appear when opening the file. By adding the image to the diffuse slot on the material, the diffuse will now be the image. In the Slate Material Editor, materials are colored blue and maps, in this case the image of the arches, are green. It is important to remember that maps plug into materials and materials are applied to objects. I can apply the arch material to the plane I created earlier using the click and drag from the material output node to the object in the 3D viewport method, or with the plane selected, click the Assign Material to Selection button in the toolbar, which applies the active material to any and all selected objects in the viewport. If the material doesn't show in the viewport, ensure that the desired material is active by double-clicking the header. A dotted line appears around the active material. Then in the toolbar, click the Show Shaded Material in the Viewport button. The texture on the plane will provide us with an easy to trace template. In the Create Shapes tab there are a number of excellent tools included for creating 2D shapes. The Helix tool is especially useful and versatile. To begin with however we will be looking at the Line tool. Click the Line tool. Notice the Auto Grid option becomes available. For this exercise we will be turning Auto Grid on so the vertices we create will all be in the same position on the Y axis, Y being forward and backward as we view the scene from a front perspective. Before we begin tracing out the shapes of the arch, let's talk a little about how lines work in Max. The Line tool allows us to select points in space that Max will connect with edges to create a two-dimensional outline or path. If I click, then release before dragging, then click again in a new position, I will create a straight line from the first point to the second point. If I click and drag without releasing, then release, and click again, I create a curved line from point to point. The different creation methods for various objects vary greatly and require practice and diligence to master. Right click or press Q to exit creation mode and switch to the modify panel. 
Shapes are made up of three objects we have seen recently. Vertexes, points in space, segments or edges, straight lines connecting two vertices, and the spline, which like the element within the editable poly is all connected polygons, a spline is all connected segments within a shape. Again, depending on what subobjects selection is active, different tools appear in the command panel. One tool I often use is the fillet tool. It is found in the vertex selection mode. It will nicely round out corners without adding unnecessary points. Making your model only as complex as they need to be is a vital skill in modeling. Let's delete this and trace out an arch. Click the front panel on the view cube in the top right corner of the viewport. Now press Alt W to make the active viewport full screen. Maneuver the view so the arch fills the viewport. Use the viewport shortcuts you learned in Module 2. Using the click and release before dragging method, I move around the shape in a manner as to finish where I started and end with a closed shape. I only put in straight lines to minimize the number of points in the shape. Using the fillet tool on the corner vertices rounds them out and completes the shape of the arch. There are many tools available for refining your shape, including tools to add vertices and remove them. In its current state, the shape will not render. We can fix this with a modifier. In the Modify panel, click the Modifier list and press the S to find the Shell modifier. Apply it to the arch shape. The arch now has depth and volume and will be renderable. In its current state, we can control the inner and outer amount and other properties of the shell modifier, and we still have access to the shape properties. But we do not have direct control over the polygons, vertices, and such that make up the shell modifier. To give us access to those properties and tools I discussed earlier, we can either A, add and edit poly modifier, or B, with the object selected, right-click, then select convert to editable poly. Either method will grant you access to the amazing world of vertices, edges, polygons, and elements, and the tools there that will allow you to model the exact shape you want. I encourage you to review Module 2 for lighting and rendering directions to ensure you are correctly using the Quicksilver Engine to render the frames you want and saving them properly. Additionally, review Video 1 in this module to reinforce the concept of modifiers. You have a world of tools and options waiting to be explored and learned. One more thing, since you now know how to use an image as a texture in Max, it's time to begin to build your texture library. Textures.com is a great site that offers many high quality images for download. A basic account is free. Some textures are premium only, but there are plenty of excellent free images. Start now. You never know when you will need the perfect texture. Happy modeling.